Greetings, lords and ladies, thems and theys. You have been summoned to another episode of the Channel Tasters Podcast. I am your host, Sir J, the Ever Confident, and joining me are two other legendary warriors, Sir Brian the Indecisive, and Sir Tony Poeticart. How are you doing this fine afternoon, gentlemen? I'm awake. That's as much as I'll ever be. I was just going to say, I am okay, given the uh, unique time and all that. Yep. But, uh... Yeah, I also have a door to heaven, as you guys can see. And I, I bet you guys are wondering, hey, that's weird. Why didn't we get a podcast episode last week? And why is your background, why are your backgrounds so bright? Uh, Brian and Jay, and why is Tony a cute anime girl? Hell yeah. Well, answers to those questions are, in order, uh, we're recording this during the day, uh, for this one instance, so, sun glare. Uh, the next one, why Tony is a cute anime girl, actually is connected to why we have to, uh, record during the day. So, full disclosure... This episode is actually a reshoot. We recorded the Unicorn episode on time. However, when I got into it and started editing, I could not hear Tony. At all. So, I was like, well, it's unfair to have it just be a me and Brian thing when Tony is there. And I want people to hear Tony's opinions because there's some really funny jokes Tony gets in there. And so, yep. I was like, all right. We'll figure out a way. Uh, we finally convinced Tony that his mic is the problem. So right now, until he gets a replacement mic, uh, hopefully sometime next month, uh, we are having Tony use his phone. Hence why we're using his a version of his uh, Weeb Edition Avi. And regrettably, we lost not just one episode, but two. Yep. We also uh, tried to cover the uh, currently uh, ever talked about uh, Nimona, which was a great movie. Um, and a great episode uh, with a, with another, like, I think that was close to the unanimous score. No, um, it was. I got my uh, things mixed around. Uh, it was uh, it was Nimona where we convinced you. And... Uh... Uh, where you change your score? Yeah, 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 yeah. To where? Yeah. To where? Yeah. Everybody. Yeah, has get, the yeah. Same exact score. Yeah. So we can go ahead and spoil that because that's a lost episode. Uh, we loved Nimona. We gave it a nine point five, uh, all across the board. So yep. go watch it. I wish we could go into more detail, but like literally, that was a whole episode in itself, and uh, we don't got time. And it's we such don't. a complicated. But awesome thing that it, to talk about it would be to uh, do a whole episode. Yeah. Um, and another note uh, of housekeeping before we get started with the show proper. Uh, mm -hmm. This episode, because this is a reshoot, will not include screen time or news and trailers because all of those are time-sensitive segments. And, you know... Yeah, there, uh, which regrettably includes mm -hmm. includes uh, Deadpool three news, and then also uh, the Superman Legacy, like big, yep, uh, casting character announcements. Yep, yep. Unfortunate, but hey, you'll still get some nerd news every weekend with our boy Brian here. So exactly, no, wor no worries about we're, that. We're picking that up next time. Mm -hmm. We yeah. also with at least one really big news story I would just see. Oh but, yeah, no, th th that's going to be a very good discussion, and I would l I would love to hear you guys' opinions on the, that story in particular. Also, Brian, luckily for our friend here, he curates those trailers that will be attached to episodes, regardless. So we may mm. so. I mean, we could, we, I mean, we could, I mean, we could technically, but... Could technically, if not for the fact that I've already... Deleted the playlist. That's our issue. To, to make room for the new. But, yeah, um, so, uh, those segments will not be here 
in this week's episode but you guys are actually getting two in one week because of this mishap so double the channel chasers and the following episode will include all our usual segments so don't worry about that but we are yep. here to discuss a show that we gushed about for like two hours on its own without the extra segments and that is, of course, Gandhi Kartakovsky's new hit for Max slash Adult Swim, Unicorn Warriors Eternal. So, yeah, that's, this show is amazing. I can't wait to talk about it. But first, since we don't actually have news or any of the other segments, I want to take the time to do something that we kind of glossed over in the original recording, but now we have more time to actually talk about it. I want to take some time to just appreciate the man Gandhi Tartakovsky's work. So what are you guys, mm -hmm. some of your guys' favorite works from Gandhi Tartakovsky? Hmm. Well, Gee. I'm not as, uh, I, I wasn't as familiar with his stuff as uh, y'all. So I definitely have to go with a uh, classic uh, Samurai Jack. Yeah, for sure. J Jack is great. Uh, for me, the list is, uh, I mentioned this off camera with Bry, but for me, Gandhi Tartakovsky is the American animation equivalent to Studio Trigger for me. I will watch anything Studio Trigger puts out, even if I don't particularly like it. And same thing with Gandhi, although I've never not liked a Gandhi project. That's the only difference. Um, well, uh, you've never not liked a Gandhi project where he was directing. Fair. Okay, that's that's true. That's true. Because uh, he only wrote the uh, last, the fourth uh, Transylvania movie. Okay. Yeah. So that's fair. any project Gendy actually heads and is directly involved in. I've all I've liked them all. Uh, Symbiotic mm -hmm. Titan is a banger that was gone too soon. Jack was absolutely yep. phenomenal, and I'm glad it got to finish, even if I don't agree with the ending. Uh, Dexter's Lab. Is, uh, I hadn't. Mm -hmm. I was going to say I hadn't watched it, but I've heard good things about Primal. Primal is fantastic as well. Uh, that utilizes a lot of the original, uh, like early season Samurai Jack, um, like all action, very minimal, act, up to no dialogue type of thing, and it's great. Uh, just just to showcase Gendy's skills. Um, Dexter is an absolute classic, of course. Oh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah. One thing that I definitely want to mention, being the uh, DC fanboy that I am, Gandy Kartakovsky got his right. early break and work as an animator on Batman the Animated Series. He animated the pilot episode on Leather Wings. Ooh. So nice. there's that. Apparently uncredited. Yep. Wow. And, and also, as a Star Wars fanboy, as you guys have seen in our various Star oh, Wars yeah. episodes that we've done for the podcast, I would be remiss to mention that Gandhi Tartakovsky made the greatest mm -hmm. version of the Clone Wars. I'm sorry, Dave Filoni, yours is great too, but man, Gandhi Tartakovsky's Clone Wars animated shorts were on a whole nother level. Man, so good. Like and, Clone Wars mm, animated Grievous is a whole different monster. Ah oh, man, I'm, mm, uh, we're not going to get into that. That's a whole. That's a, I, I would go on a long Star Wars tangent. We're not going to do that though. Out for Tartakovsky's work as an animator and artist. Mm -hmm. All the things that he has done throughout his career have been very cinematography. Uh, like the cinematography is just pitch perfect oh yeah no he's he's very he's very good at mm -hmm. shot composition and storyboarding in that sense um he's talked about oh, it yeah. in a lot of interviews because I, I follow gendy a lot and I, I watch a lot of his interviews because he's uh, been very inspirational to me um gendy has talked about that he learned english because you know he's an uh he him and his family immigrated from russia to america in i think either the 70s or the 80s and he learned English through reading comic books and watching cartoons. 
and one of the first comic books he read was Luke Cage. And that's how he got really into like the black exploitation like action genre. So much so that he had a full circle moment a few years ago where he got to do a Luke Cage miniseries he wrote and drew for Marvel in the classic 70s Luke Cage style. It's fucking amazing. Uh, that's, just, that's just great. But oh, one thing that I can always appreciate when it comes to any creative, be that like an artist, writer, director, that they have an idea. That's why I love a lot of what just the principles of uh, what Tarantino does so mm-hmm. much. Also, and I think in mm-hmm. too, where they take cinematography to a degree where they do it for the sake of the shot, not for the sake of a joke like, mm-hmm. or an action yeah, scene. Like, like when you see uh, fight scenes or any other like moment in Samurai Jack, you feel things at that moment oh you, you really get that you really get that in primal because there's mm-hmm. no almost no dialogue at all so he gendy is very good at just letting the animation speak for itself which is phenomenal and also i can't you know not end this gendy appreciation segment without saluting the good man for his dedication to the cause of ass men everywhere Mm-hmm. With just man. S- supplying us with just sick women in all of his shows, unicorn included. Yes, indeed. So, although salute to you, sir. Although yes, unicorn is it, unicorn's probably the mo- the most lacking. Unfortunately, it's got a few. Mm-hmm. There are some in there. Don't don't get it twisted. It's still in there. It's just not as prominent as I would have liked. Which is, oh, and that's a shame to me too because part of uh, what got me to love thick women is Gindy's work. Hundred percent. I will. I mean, uh, nothing will beat uh, Dexter's mom. Let's also not forget Gendy Kardashevsky was college buddies with one Craig McCracken, so he also helped with the Powerpuff Girls, and he designed another uh, cartoon crush and, you know, uh, <laughs> sick cartoon woman of uh, the Miss late me. 90s, early 2000s, Miss Sarah Bellum. I, I, I was just mentioning that tall drink of water. God and damn, Sedusa. Woman. And Sedusa. Let's not forget Sedusa. Yeah, Sedusa, she was bad, but... No, eh. Miss Bellum definitely beat Sedusa in terms of a, like, a sex appeal contest. But we can't Which deny that Sedusa because... isn't... Uh, we can't deny that Sedusa is thick as fuck, too. She, she it was, was weird, thick. though, because uh, you never see uh, Sarah Bellum's mate. No, but you see the important parts. <laughs> you see the important parts. <laughs> You don't I'll need that. you don't need to see her face because you don't gotta look at you don't gotta look in her eyes to know that she's always telling the truth because those hips do not lie. And w- there's one thing that we could say for sure, Jay. We like big we like big butts. We, we cannot, cannot lie. lie, not at all. Mm-hmm. And also. We and we know for a fact she would have a good looking face. She okay? would. I mean, Gendy Gendy does not draw ugly characters unless it's like purposefully ugly. Or I think it's more so an anime, like a creative choice. Mm. With uh, some of his characters have that rubber hose kind of style oh, yeah, to them. The, yeah, that's because uh, he was a big fan of Popeye as kid. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that with that style of animation, you can get away with uh, a more malleable, uh, more expressive kind of character. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Unicorn, I mean, that's one thing I definitely noticed. And... Oh, yeah. Unicorn, for well, sure. Unicorn, uh, yeah. Unicorn. he uh, specifically has come out and said that uh, definitely was trying to mimic the art styles of... Uh, 
like Popeye and uh, the early anime. Yep. And like... The ex- the expression art is all- something Gendy's always been a master at. Like even early seasons, Jack, where he barely talked, the expressions are what sold it. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing with mm-hmm. stuff like Symbiotic Titan, a lot of the comedy in Dexter. Like and uh, one specific character in a unicorn, but we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So. I hope you guys enjoyed this tangent that was still related to the topic, but a tangent nonetheless. So now we're going to get into talking about the show proper. uh, But first, we're going to do our spoiler free section. Just give our kind of initial thoughts. So, Tony, we'll start with you. What did you think about Unicorn going in? What you like about it uh, without spoiling and uh, all that stuff? And then we'll go to Brian and then I'll end us off and then we'll go into the spoiler section show good show really good (laughs) because some of the things i want to say is for the more spoiler part of the review and there's some points that i just really want to get across that why i love the show so much without spoiling it and i don't want to Ruin that for the folks at home. So I'm just going to say, the show is really good. Go see it, folks. It's fantastic. Okay. Brian, your initial thoughts. Uh, Beyond the fact that I believe we did react to the trailer, um, and the reputation of Gendy, I didn't know too much about the show, so... I was uh, relatively surprised, and uh, I ended up really liking it. So on the other end of the spectrum, we have me, who, like I mentioned, I'm a huge Gandhi fan, and I follow a lot of cartoon review YouTube channels. Uh, Shout out to Ostrich Vox and the Roundtable, who actually, you know, broke the news about Unicorn when the concept art was first released uh, that's how i found out about it and once i saw the concept art and heard the concept and who it was you know going to be done by i was already sold i was ready i needed this yesterday and i'm happy to report gendy proved me right once again i needed this yesterday it's amazing the world building is fantastic It plays with some of my favorite aspects of mythology and introduces other aspects of mythology that I like, but aren't highlighted as frequently, uh, especially in Western cartoons. So it's fantastic stuff. We'll talk about it in more detail in the spoiler section, but definitely go see it, folks. It it 100% gets the Channel Chaser's stamp of approval. All right. So with that being said... We are going to now jump into the spoiler section. If you have not seen all eight episodes of Unicorn Warriors Eternal, they are available on HBO Max, or Max for short, because Max took over, apparently. I don't know who Max is, but I guess he's doing a good job. And, um, you know, if if you got Max, go watch it. If you have a family member or a friend who has Max have a watch party or borrow a password we're not shaming you and uh if you don't want to give these greedy corporations your money i'm not shaming you either do your thing i'm not gonna you know report any sailing of the the seas in particular on my other channel i am a pirate vtuber so i can't really you know criticize that kind of thing so do you but bottom line go watch it so, without further ado, five, four, three, two, one. Spoiler alert. All right. Are the spoiler free people gone? Good. Let's begin. Holy shit. Holy Good. shit. Yeah. Was this show amazing? All right. So, I want to just kick it off with the world building. Because, man, this world building is phenomenal. Because it takes 
strong elements from Arthurian legend and incorporate it into its uh, main backbone, as well as merging it with the steampunk, like Gilded Age England, which is also very fascinating. And then we get other cultures from around the world and their different mythologies represented, like Hindu mythology, which if you haven't looked into Hindu mythology, very much like Japanese mythology, Hindu mythology is one giant shonen anime. Yeah, it, stuff gets buck wild. Because one of my favorite things about uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of Hindu myths is just the sheer insanity yeah. and how fantastic storytelling is. Like when you have a moment in one epic where you have one man who can fight really good with a mace and another dude that could fight really good with a mace. And when they beat the shit out of each other, they're equal. Yep. But since they're trained under the same master, and in order to beat the second guy, the first guy had to ex like exploit a weakness that the first guy didn't expect. Mm hmm Would do. Yeah. No, it's a it's a lot of crazy oh. shit, and Unicorn really embraces the insanity of mythology and weaves it into its story very well, um, especially oh, yeah. with its characters. So let's go ahead and start talking about those characters. We are going to group Melinda and Emma together. Yes, they are two separate entities, but their stories are quite literally intertwined. So we're just going to talk about them together. And I got to say, I love them. Their friendship that they eventually develop is wholesome and sweet. I love how they help each other. Like... Emma gains confidence thanks to Melinda, and Melinda gets to work through her trauma thanks to Emma, who actually comes from a family that is very open and loving. And shout out to the Fairfaxes. You guys, I don't blame y'all, all right? Like, you reacted like any normal person would when the shit went down. So I don't understand the people who are trying to give the Fairfaxes like, you know, flack for their actions. I mean, well, he is a bit, the dad is a bit misogynistic. It's the 1800s, and... man. I know, the but still. Time, Brian. Okay, so. Don't go after my ass just for. No, 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 no. I'm not going after little thing. No, we're, no we're, we're just, we're just pointing out like the, of course he's misogynistic. It's the 1800s. I'm not saying it's right, but. It's the time. Yes, exactly. That was what I was trying I know. to say. And it's like, come uh, on. Uh, I mean, if yeah, some things he has his issues, but he's trying. Yeah, no, yeah. he he's a good dad yeah. overall. Like, I don't understand why people are hating on Lord Fairfax. I mean, well, don't be me to this, like, Scotsman. And also, okay. he has an epic mustache. You cannot go wrong with an epic fucking mustache. Mostly, I was a little, a little against, a little against him, um, thinking that he was overreacting a little bit until the scene where she's like riding from the tub and just looks back at them with that crazed look. But I, I mean, mean, also, like, okay. think about when they first see Emma post that weird, you know wedding transformation she yeah, breaks that... she breaks through the window has different color the different color hair did not go away so this wasn't just her dyeing it or something and then she's creepily putting on her dress and a wig to pretend to be her old self yeah i would react like mr fairfax i would get paranoid and start to you know go a little overboard because like what the fuck is happening to my kid yeah, and also it was something that most well-to-do families at that time would have done. Yeah. Not 
that's a good thing to yeah. do. Not that we endorse it. Like, let's right. make that very clear. But it is accurate to the time. I mean, like uh, one time Whistler would say, the past was the worst. <laughs> oh, 100%. The past is always the worst. Shout out to Simon. Good lad. Excellent podcaster. Uh, but yeah. So, with Melinda, man, her story was amazing because, like, you know, I love King Arthur and Arthurian reimaginings. Those are always my shit. Yeah. Uh, you know, rest in peace to Cursed, another show that we get that's in the audio archive. So check that Spotify oh, yeah. link for that. Indeed. That show was great. Way better. Oh yeah. For sure. Also, Merlin was involved in another show that we covered that uh that was on Netflix. What was it called again? It was the one with the kids. The it was like Sherlock No, it wasn't Merlin, but it was the guy who played Merlin was playing Sherlock Holmes. That's what it was. Uh, the Irregulars? Yeah, The Irregulars. There you go. That was another sh show but, uh, that got canceled as well. And uh, there was one other show that included Merlin that we would have talked about if we were doing the podcast at the time. Oh, yeah? Once upon a time. Oh, fair. Yeah. Sexy Merlin. Oh, <laughs> oh man. I wish we had recorded that conversation with Cap and turned that into a video. That would have been great. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Because we tried to explain that show to our buddy Cap, who uh, some of you might know from... Uh... His appearances on the podcast. Yeah. And uh, we literally gave that man a headache. Oh, man. Like... <laughs> I have never heard somebody yell, God damn it, sexy Merlin so many times. It was hilarious. But more on to the point, I love this Merlin reimagining. The fact that Merlin actually has a child with Morgan Le Fay is yeah. amazing. And they're not painting Morgan as your classical evil witch bad guy that a lot nope. of portrayals of Morgan post 1500s do because yeah. fun fact for all of you who aren't Arthurian nerds out there Morgan started out as Arthur's benevolent sister who just occasionally played pranks on her brother and trolled her sons to test their courage and whatnot. But I mean, that that's one thing I was about to say too, because uh, like most myths, it goes through various different interpretations mm -hmm. through the course of time and and cultural changes and cultural perspectives. And one of the things that I find very entertaining is that the core of myths don't necessarily change, but the characterization... Yeah, it's, the, it's the perspective. You know, uh, this, yeah. this honestly could be a whole dissertation, but basically, to to cut through all the super nerdy jargon, uh, when Christianity was more embraced during the Middle Ages, that's when Morgan became villainized as a witch, and, you know, they changed her role from being the one who escorts Arthur to Avalon to... You know, partake in his eternal sleep to wake to awaken once Britain needs him again, to his arch enemy who wanted to destroy Camelot, but then has a change of heart at the end, repents for her sins, and then takes Arthur to Avalon. So yeah, well, it's, I, yeah, it's a whole thing. And then the French happened. Yeah, the French happened. And they so, added their yeah. super cool OC, Lancelot. Yo, yeah. Cool. Yep. Um, yeah, like... but um, I will say about the show though. Going back to this one, uh huh. Um, one thing that I liked that they did with Merlin was the fact that they embraced the the like typical like old man just stereotypical wizard thing. Mm -hmm. But that was like what the public thought Merlin was. Yeah, and then we actually got to see the real Merlin. Yeah. No. And and. 
what I like about Unicorn is honestly what I like about every version of Merlin that I've seen so far adapted in media, at least to my recollection. Every Merlin has gotten the aspect of his personality right that Merlin is a dick and a shit starter. Oh, yeah. Even sexy Merlin. Yep. He, especially sexy Merlin. What do you mean? Like, uh, look, when you're part demon because your father is an incubus, so when you have the tendency of just, hey, I feel like starting shit up today. Yep. Let's see what happens. And also, you don't fully understand humans because of your demonic heritage. So there's a lot of miscommunications there. So, yeah, he's a dick. And Unicorn does that very well with his relation uh, by showing his relationship with Melinda and oh, yeah. him not knowing Ooh. how to parent properly. Oh, yeah. That and the hug scene. Oh, the hug scene is oh. my absolute favorite. Uh, because, like, that moment was so fantastic. Where, like, she finally has her... Uh, Melinda finally has her breakthrough with her father. And Emma, in the reflection, is like, You know you can hug her, right? And then he's like, But that's not a thing we do. And then he looks at Melinda. Do you require a hug? And you just see Melinda very well. He tried. But, but that moment, yeah. that moment was then ended rather abrupt, abruptly. Dang by it, our Sing. Boy. Dang Sing. it, Sing. Ah, uh, I love you, oh. but dang. Motherfucking one in water. I get I'll it. Give him... You got to stay it's hydrated. Like... It's important. But dang. Yeah, it. but damn, dude. Wait a ruin a moment. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I I really love it. Um, I love the the uh, mystery and cliffhanger at the end that base that did confirm to us that Morgan is not a bad guy in this universe. Um, that she genuinely did want to protect Melinda from the power because it seems like Melinda's power is a merger between Merlin's demon magic and Morgan's fey magic. Yeah. So, super powerful shit. And, uh, I'm just kicking myself because I just now realized the little bit of parallels between, uh, Morgan and, uh, Phoenix from Marvel. Yeah, straight up. And also, yeah. uh, something that I realized uh, mid-recording of the original version of this episode is that... Well, actually, I realized it right before we got on camera for the original recording of the Unicorn episode was that Melinda was a direct... Melinda's name was a direct hint that Merlin was her father. Her name is Melinda. Merlin. Duh. Duh. Uh, like, yeah. wow. But yeah, it's great. It's such a good dynamic. Uh, I loved the bits we got where we saw just Melinda and Merlin as a duo. I hope we get to see more of that next season. Yeah, and uh, I want to, I do want to also see uh, next season moments where it's like pre sing and it's the three of them. Mm -hmm. And something else. Uh, that I'm very interested in as well, uh, again, being an Arthurian nerd, is we know Melinda is born to suffer because, unfortunately for her, she was born a Pendragon. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. that's and, just uh, not good for anybody. Arthur is nope. probably just somewhere out there sleeping. Yep. I want to know what her, like, relationship with her uncle is. Does her uncle even know she exists? Yeah. Like, so many questions there. If she was raised in secret by Merlin and Morgan, yeah. then that... Uh, yeah, Arthur, really Arthur probably doesn't know, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and uh you know well, we also, we also because... speculated that um it's very strongly implied that melinda was raised in the tower of avalon slash the garden of avalon the mythical tower that morgan ironically trapped merlin in in some iterations in some iterations it's uh vivane the lady of the lake but in other iterations it's morgan yeah and uh also we can assume the whole being kept secret thing but how much she freaked the fuck out when she found out that uh melinda had magic yep that's true so there's mm. a there's a lot of layers there i would also really like to see what her relationship to her half brother mordred is like if they even got to know each other i want to know if she got to know any of her siblings like gawain yaris gaharis aggravane i'm sorry fate just automatically makes me hate aggravane it's not your fault aggravane but your fate counterpart is a shit bird uh, mm -hmm. and, okay be fair to the fate counterpart to Agravane. He he's not really going to win out in the department when you look like Gilles de Rey. So also fair. So, but yeah, that's the and, Emma, uh, we talked about stuff. Melinda. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that uh, you talked about like things we want to see with her, like especially with people. Uh huh. I would like to see her like have a little bit of one on one with just her and Sing because yeah we never actually got Ooh. just a them duo episode we got a Sing and Copernicus episode which was great um, we got a Melinda and Copernicus episode yep we got a Melinda Edrin episode but we never got a Melinda Sing episode that's true actually that's one thing that. I find very interesting it like you mentioned before, Jay. I wonder how they meet uh Sing initially back before Copernicus was in the picture. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be very mm -hmm. interesting and that'd be a great way to explore that dynamic yep. before the continual soul swapping and possessing of people you know yeah for sure so yeah meet og thing before we uh jump into sang and the other chosen agents of unicorn i want to take this small detour to talk about who i affectionately refer to as jesse and james oh god the oh, the, goober. the goobers yes <laughs> I affectionately refer to them as Jesse and James because that's basically oh, what they are. A... Because Jesse and James wander around in big, overcomplicated mechanical contraptions and bumble their way into situations just like those guys. But uh, unlike Jesse and James, these guys are they're... actually quite. We don't actually know if they're competent. Okay, so they we know they can the... fight. The... They give the they give the veneer of co uh, competency, but we haven't seen it. Yeah, they gave the, energy, but do well, they actually dish it out? Which is well, we saw at least him dish it out. No, we yeah no. Um, I'm, I'm as saying as a distraction. We I'm saying we know they can fight, but like fighting the fighting is not what all that equals competency. That that yeah, and with that True. because Jesse and but James, they also have good knowledge of like everything. I mean, Jesse and James are very knowledgeable, especially James. True. And True. But when they're not yeah, battling Pikachu, two... they're actually good battlers. So when but yeah, back to the unicorn though, mm -hmm. the descendants they were uh, pretty cool characters. Uh, oh, fuck, but. Great. Yeah, no, their their uh, gag didn't overstay its welcome, which you know I was glad for. They definitely explore like do something that stuff like this rarely does, which is explore like the like psychological ramifications 
of like people taking over your body. Yeah, and that's uh, that was an interesting yeah. angle that like we never get to see in reincarnation stories, especially if you're a fan of anime, which we all know Gendy is. And I I like that they're actually taking this approach. Also, with Jesse and James, we got to see a lot of the mythological Easter eggs dropped when they were going through their artifacts. So there's a lot of cool things that I think we can see, especially now that time is all time and space are all fucky wucky thanks to the final battle at the end. Yeah, More wibbly wobbly than Doctor Who. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, when you see fucking dinosaurs try to eat people's asses, right well, next to the Great Pyramids of Giza. Yeah. It's wild. It, it's... And a old timey uh, airplane is flying by. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Or, but my favorite thing, and I even mentioned this in the uh, actual uh, first recording, is mm-hmm. I love their take on just spiritualism. Because back in those times as well, especially around like uh, first world countries, yep. spiritualism would be big thing like occultism was the hotness yep and so... especially in england that like a lot of charlatans got away with that stuff that's how crowley's cult got so big and you know a lot of other occultists like him and they poke fun of that in the show proper mm-hmm. and one of my favorite when you show cops scotland yard of all people like of all organizations in fiction, one of the most competent yeah. police force in yeah. the world, mm-hmm. being outsmarted by what they think are just spiritualist crime lords. Yeah, that's shit. actually probably my favorite scene in the entire show when they investigate the church because the mayor believes the uh, you know supposedly crazy old man's ramblings about the magic fox lady. And so and then, the, the police chief is all dismissive about it. It's like, okay, I'll go have my pie while you while you gents go find the magic fox lady. And then the magic fox lady shows up, hip swinging like a motherfucker. Mm. No, no, she whips absolute ass. The her first appearance, those hips were swaying every which way, good sir. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It was it was uh, um it, look, we're gonna bring up fate a lot in this, uh and you know, people who watched our our, our strange fake episode, me and Tony, you got you guys know. Like me uh, and Tony and like, had the fir- the same first thought, even though we watched it at two separate times when the Fox lady showed up. I was we both actually said the exact same phrase. Hello? Tomamo? Is that you? Tomamo no mai? Oh, Is man. that you? Oh man, good shit. Yeah, and then um, the police chief just being like, "It was a magic fox lady." That was yeah, fucking priceless. Hovered, yeah, and in. I do want to point out something. Uh huh. That uh, we didn't talk about in a uh, first recording. Okay. The fact that the the old kook was uh, meant to uh, distract the police from the fox lady. But he but betrayed yeah. told them. Yeah, but he betrayed them and actually gave them right information. Yeah, he, man was paid off. That was hilarious. Yep. That was but great. one thing that I love, especially because I mentioned this in the first recording, you get to see a lot of great comedy animation from Gendy. Mm-hmm. Like, you have bug, which, fun fact for the folks at home, Bulldogs are my favorite breed of dogs. You see a bulldog with a painted third eye just bite the whole ass. Whole ass of one cop. Oh, man, that was hilarious. Definitely gave me flashbacks of uh, Nimona. Oh, yeah, the whole otter conversation. Yeah, 100%. And also, getting into, like, the idea of spiritual charlatism, Mm-hmm. During that time, uh, the one of the individuals that was a big, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Enabler yep. of that 
That one. Uh... Oh yeah, the the fortune teller guy. Yeah. I also so... just I love the joke because you know, M. Thanks to Emma, he accidentally stumbles upon actually like, opening the veil ooh. for a second, and it freaks yeah. him the fuck out. So when Emma shows up again, being like, "Okay, you did it one time. Please help me. I need to go back." He his reaction is, "Get the fuck away from me." Get the fuck away. No, I ain't helping it's, you. It's all fake. Sure. We're all fake. No, this shit isn't real. Get the fuck away from me. Fuck this shit. I'm out. I don't care if it is actually real. I don't want any part of it, madam. And it was hilarious. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, even during that time, especially in the 1800s, because Fun fact, there were a lot of things that have, well, a lot of things like that have happened throughout the course of human history. I mean, human woman giving birth to rabbits, turned out that was a sham. Yep. Who would thought? Right? Oh, man. Like, every day you have rabbits flying out of there. It's the it's the P.T. Barnum principle, man. That That's the whole thing that the... Uh... You know, the charlatans in that little, yeah. like, m- magic square, like, abided by. And for those of you who you don't t- know the P.T. Barnum principle, it's uh, that famous quote that is actually misattributed to him. A sucker is born every minute. Mm-hmm. And also, yeah. you have a bit of showmanship with your, uh, your, with your charlatans, with your, Charlotte when you're Henry. trying to be, yeah. Yeah, you, you have to you have to be a bit show. You have to be a showman. You have to uh, wow the crowd. That's why I got. It, that's why I give props to the fortune teller dude because he had a lot of good showmanship. Like he had the like uh, bike pedal and all of that. Yep the, the the smoke machine, all that shit, which was I mean, pretty advanced for like given you know their time frame. I mean, it's a steampunk world. I kind of figured that was going to happen anyway. And when you have steampunk robots, oh yeah. But one I could I could live without was uh, some things that could be seen as a a bit racist. I'm like, I mean, Ugh. okay, like yes, those are very stereotypical caricatures. But also, and once again, I will repeat: oh, this fine. is not me endorsing the uh the action of it but the basis for a lot of this are your old school adventure novels and like you know those type of stories and a lot of those had your racial caricatures yeah and And i will i will add here as someone that actually did the research and, like, looked into it, unlike back then with those stuff, the voice actors are actually... Representative of the, the right. yeah caricatures yeah. that they, they play. The, yeah. the fortune teller guy is voiced by an Indian actor. The Rakshasa we see later is also voiced by an Indian actor. Which I, to be fair, I didn't think the Rosh Shasa was a caricature. I thought it was oh, just a really cool. No, it's not. It's not. It's not a caricature. I was just it, like, it's a. It, it's just that, like you know, it's it's voiced by a you know Indian Great. actor because it's a Hindu creature of myth. Yeah, and I and I agree with the sentiment. I just thought. I didn't see the voice act. I I saw just a cool voice actor no. voicing this Tiger Man. Jay was just saying that that like the caricature, that. it was appropriate. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, what, I, I mean, the Rock Shasta had a thick Indian accent too. So, well, I didn't even. Well, I'm just saying from my perspective, I didn't notice that it was an accent at all. So. Hmm. Maybe maybe you just haven't um, met enough Indian people. I don't know. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Moving on to our next set of characters. We go from positive to negative, And that's not to say that we don't like these boys. Uh. But we gotta just get this out of the way. Let Tony get his rant on. 
We're talking about yeah. Winston and Edrin. Go ahead, Tony. We'll mute. Let you do your thing. Go off, King. These men just be big simping. Just... Uh, I had a huge, long thing about what my problems were from the initial recording. However, I'm going to take a more calm, muted response saying, folks, boys, when you're trying to uh, impress a woman or try to... When you love somebody, you want to do things that are crazy, that are beyond the pale insane. Winston, my ginger, you need to know that when your fiancé is possessed by a uh, force to save the world, you gotta pull it back, buddy. You gotta pull it back. It's it's okay. When you don't pull back and it's your own gentleman's pride, leads you to becoming a werewolf, good sir. So I Humble. do actually like how they utilize the trope to some extent because like we've been talking about, like characterizations being appropriate for the time, them not them unintentionally not giving Emma or Melinda agency with the she's mine, no she's mine constant bickering is very it's, much in well, keeping with the you know women are trophies and property trope of like victorian and you know early onset england yeah, yeah and, and um let's be honest here gentlemen this is like a core thing of channel chasers we know a lot of love triangles. Yeah. And, uh, this is kind of on the lower end. Yeah, it, it's way less confusing than Exo Kitty, I'll tell you that. that well, at least like Exo a... Kitty was confusing on purpose. It was confusing on purpose. We actually knew the direction of the love square over there. But, like, this love square is really fucky. I, I, I don't know yeah. if I like it. I, I'm I'm not the biggest fan of it either. But yeah. the point I'm trying to make, and also I can I'm the son of a redhead. I can use that as a old joke holdover from the first recording. Cause Winston is a redhead. But for Edrin, look dude, I get it. You fell in love with a badass uh sorceress. I mean, who doesn't want to uh, have that much power just helping you save the world and you two fall in love with each other? That's great. That's fantastic. But when you see that person that you love so dearly go through a crisis that something went wrong, that this is for you too, Winston, when you... When both of you utter, utter simpletons can't see that the person that you love is in crisis, you only see things from your perspective fully. Yeah, that that's definitely a them problem. That is a that's a you problem, there, boys. And a point that uh, Brian brought up in the original recording that I want to bring up again is that. I'm really interested in seeing how the fuck Melinda and Edrin fell in love because all we saw flashback wise was yeah. I want to kill you. How do you go from enemies to lovers like that? Especially with mm. that intensive a hatred. And that's one thing oh, that, yeah. that I applaud Brian to point out. And it's very evident of Gendy using a lot of tropes like that, but never really, yeah, like giving us overplaying something to them. Think. Yeah, yeah. And Brian, good on you for noticing that because that was something that Jay and I didn't catch initially. Yep. And like something, something along with that is we see at least that this current 
incarnation of Edrin doesn't know anything about the Morgana stuff. Did Melinda actually open up enough to Edrin in their original incarnations to tell him and the past incarnation just didn't unlock that memory? Or did she just keep that bottled up? I'm leaning towards the she kept it bottled up, especially with how she reacted to Melinda. Or Emma? Well, my bad. I, it, I seems like, it seems like uh, she's the only one out of the group where uh, she has active, like, conscious memories of the host. Ah. Uh, yeah, that's true. Because Edrin, remember, his body was that straight magician dude. I mean, but also Edrin had memories of the Elven Kingdom and his promise and the marriage and. Yeah, all and that stuff. No, I was saying, I was saying memories of their human life, like oh, their house well, life. Well, I, I wasn't talking about the human life. I was talking about the did Edrin tell Melinda, or did Melinda tell Edrin about the Morgana stuff? Which, to my own mm. opinion, I agree with. Jay. She did not. I did too. Because let's think of it like this: Would she at that time in her care? In her life. Would she ever tell anybody that? Yeah, because she wasn't able to open up about it until Emma helped her with it. So I definitely don't think she told Edrin about it. Like, her exactly. first reaction when Emma found out was to get super pissed at her. And then she realized, mm -hmm. wait, you were there. It was you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which and... also, thank God that we're doing, like the loop time travel rules so it's not confusing the if you travel back in time you were supposed to travel back in time mm -hmm. kind of thing but that's what makes the gag for saying about like him jumping through the sea of time and constantly reappearing at the same spot it's the whole you're meant to travel here that's the only place you can go time travel rules Exactly. Yeah, applying it, applying it to a different franchise, Futurama. I am my own grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's that's one of the most like disturbing yet hilarious plot lines in animation. Oh, it is most definitely. But I, this is how strong of a uh, leading character that we have when it comes to Melinda and Emma. We just go back to talking about them when we're supposed to be talking about other characters. Yeah. And I mean, when it comes to those two, and I think I've made my points abundantly clear, these two acting like total uh, idiots and simps. Yep. It's the more annoying part of their characterization, which yeah. Like, Granted, it will always happen. And they and they also do it in different ways, which I appreciate at least. Like it's different uh, you, degrees of simpage. Winston simpage is the adorable puppy simpage, whereas Edrin I find a little more annoying because he's the petty type of simpage. Like the oh, pretending he doesn't mm -hmm. care, but then when she reacts, he's like, oh, yes, she does care. Yes, yes, yes. Just tell yeah, her, dummy. End. And at the end, oh. the uh, how could this happen to me? You're not a Sundere, Edrin. You don't get to do that. No. Just tell like, her look, already. Look, bro, you were supposed to be this badass uh, warrior elf prince yet you're acting like a schoolgirl getting dumped come on man you're not in middle school edrin yeah. get over it and winston sir you're a gentleman i respect but, it well, but I, I know i know what you're trying to do here brother i know i get it it's a product of your time but homie Look at what's in front of you. There's a time and place for etiquette, Mr. Winston. Yeah. 
But I will admit, uh, as like a positive for both of them, um, Edrin do admire that he dropped everything to save the world and all that. And save and Melinda. Also, yeah. And also Winston, at least we didn't get too much of it, but it seemed like um, those like two weeks alone or a couple weeks alone or days or whatever it was where uh, Emma was gone and it was just him and the guy that seemed to shake some... Uh, yeah. Sense into Winston yeah, and, and he's and I, more and I think like it may it helped them form a friendship because like they both kind of shared a loss in the fact that Emma was gone for like ten years to them. Now yeah. when she comes back, Edrin gets a little how could this happen to me emo ish bit, but uh yeah. Winston yeah. just seems like And to give them on to give them more credit, like like Brian mentioned, when they actually do team up, like it seems, it seems like they're more going in the direction where they're finally putting this bullshit aside. Which, thank God, I'm glad this yeah. didn't last more than a season. And sure, it's one of my criticisms of the show. It's just because it is a, it's a trope that was just done in a way that annoyed me. And I'm Which sure I think it was, you know, that was on purpose, so I'm not going to, like, give it too much crap. Yeah, exactly, and it's just something yeah. to point out. Mm -hmm. And I think my more relaxed approach on it than my initial... <laughs> Although I will, I will tell you, folks, who uh, you know, since you guys didn't get to see and or hear the original recording, that Tony rant was priceless. That yeah. was also one of the major reasons I wanted to reshoot this because I was like, they didn't hear the Tony Simp rant. Ah, oh, damn, that was gold. Damn, in damn indeed. Yeah. But uh, one thing that I did also like about this show. Mm -hmm. Is the fact that uh, they took that whole like twist of the eternal war years, and they managed to basically find a way to add another one. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And that's really it's a cool thing to just delve deep into a show like this that is open to interpretation, but also very rooted in its characters take that and... eternals Ugh. i'm sorry i had to put it out there because the thought crossed my mind i didn't mention it in the original recording i had to bring it up now this okay. is how you do it eternals take mm -hmm. notes or just let's forget that that atrocity to cinema has ever happened Fair, but good on Camille Nanjiani. You look great, man. It, it, fantastic. But, uh, however, let's talk about a fun character. Let's talk about Sing. My favorite character in the I show. Love I love this lad. He brings so much energy to the crew of warriors. He gives me straight up Aang from Last Airbender vibes, not just because of the monk cosmic awareness kind of thing, but also just the liveliness and the like excitedness about, you know, exploring new things. It's it's very like childlike wonder and that's what made saying so fun. Especially when he, like, teamed up with Copernicus. And, like, when he piloted mm. Copernicus' body... Oh, no, Brian disappeared. We're going to keep going, though. Um, uh, when he piloted Copernicus' body, it was really funny. Like, it was just like... Pew! And then when Copernicus was, uh, like, unoperable, like, Sang did his best to, like, make the noises and shit. That was just hilarious. Definitely. And with that... And it goes for all of them too. Uh, with the this current reincarnation of the cast of, of our warriors, mm -hmm. 
play into one of my favorite tropes in fiction. The unlikely hero. Oh, yeah. They definitely follow the uh, Campbellian hero's journey motif very well. Refusing the call and, all, and you know, all the standard, you know, hero's journey steps. I'm not going to, uh, you know, bore you with going through, you know, Joseph Campbell's entire hero's journey. If you've taken a screenwriting class, you know what it is. Welcome oh, back, even... Brian. Welcome back. And you don't even need to take a a screenwriting uh, course to do that. It's in myths in general. It's a perfect study into actual uh, myth telling. Mm Because a lot of people have those moments within their own uh, stories. Yep. Like, uh, he had a... There was an adage in a book on, like, various myths from around the world that I have in my collection that is a very fascinating perspective on how Campbell views, like, collective storytelling and whatnot. Oh, yeah. And seeing really plays with this uh, real meta-narrative due to what a monk of the cosmic realm does. Mm -hmm. Very fascinating. Because, like you mentioned before, Jay, when he was going through the ocean of time and space... And going to that point in time, which was maybe like a few days into the future. Yep. And he keeps going there. He's like, this is not where I wanted to go. And it was not the future that he was expecting, yeah. but it was the where he needed to be. It was that yeah, destination. He, and that's what he eventually realized. And it's like, oh, I get it now. And By the way, uh, yep. hi. Uh-huh. No, we said welcome back, Brian. You were just quiet the whole time. Oh, no, it was still connecting. Oh. oh I didn't wow. hear you guys say that. Well, we did say uh, welcome back. Uh, yeah. All right. I, I believe you. Just uh, weather issues. It knocked out my uh, power I and heard, the router I heard, had to restart. I heard the thunder. I figured that was what happened. But, yeah, back to it. Another thing about saying that I really enjoyed, you know, we I talked about in the Gendy appreciation segment at the top of the show that Gendy, you know, mentions that he's a huge comic fan. He learned English from reading comics. And his comic nerddom just really bleeds through Sing because Sing and the Cosmic Realm is straight up classic. 60s, 70s, Ditko Lee era Doctor Strange. Yeah, indeed. And so uh, much so to the point the, that original saying looks like a buff version of Wong. Oh yeah. Yep. Yep. And yeah. And the whole like uh astral sea thing that he like goes to is definitely like a uh, reminiscent of how uh they used to portray space back in the day. Oh yeah. Kirby was very famous for that, uh, especially with like his designs and use of collage art, which you actually see a lot of in the cosmic realm. It's very, it's very Kirbyist. Like, there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of Kirbyisms in that design, and Gendy has cited, you know, Jack Kirby as a huge influence on his art, and you can really see it there, and it's great. I mean, how can you not? But the king and oh, anything yeah. that homaging like weird cosmic stuff. I mean, the Kirby Crackle, hello. Exactly. And then like just the other stuff with saying like even in his days as an urgent urgent gang leader was uh, really interesting. I hope we get to see more of what his past there was like and maybe catch up with those lads. That would be cool. Also, and I like the child wonder uh, myths that he had when he first connected. Oh, you were you weren't you weren't there when we had that whole conversation, right? No, I wasn't. My bad. See, and you thought we weren't going to get any candid funniness in this recording. I'm keeping this all in. Good. But yeah. Hey. And uh, I, just to continue, because I wasn't there. Yeah, Sting is a really cool character. I like him. You guys said all the stuff. 
Now, the only thing is, uh, I do want to see uh, how he got to be more of the badass warrior that he was at the end. And I am going to miss his like younger, more uh, happier self. But yep, this version is still cool too. And R.I.P. to the tiger mount. Oh yeah, rest in peace to lion. that. Rest in peace to that tiger or lion. Oh. It was a it was a lion. My man. Shit was huge. Yep, it was a big fuck off lion. Also, uh. You know, going back to what I referenced in the Gendi appreciation segment, if you notice when you look at aged up adult saying he should look familiar to anyone who has read classic Marvel comics. He's just straight up Luke Cage. Uh, hell in yeah. night armor. Should... Yeah, you should... Yeah. Lord. Yeah. Or should I say sweet Christmas? Right? I'm, right. I'm just, and, uh, I'm you, just you excited about for looking that shit. Familiar. Mm-hmm. I just want to point out, because I forgot to mention this in the uh, first, but uh, the, uh, the Forge Giant, anyone else get vibes of the Scotsman from uh, Samurai Jack? Yeah, oh, for yeah. sure. I honestly got vibes of the Scotsman from Lord Fairfax as well, not just because he had a Scottish accent, but like, the stubbornness, oh, yeah. you know, of the Scotsman from Jack. I mean, to be fair, just stubbornness might be a British Isles thing. Fair. Fair enough. <laughs> they are they are a stubborn, sour brunch, those Brits... Irish and various other, you know, denizens of the British Isles. No offense to our UK EU audience out there. We love you. I do check the analytics. Some of you do listen. So just want to say we love you. Um, but yeah, Sang is amazing. I love his character. The Luke Cage shit just has me hyped to see what full potential Sang can do. Because think about it. Like, yeah, he was a badass fighter, but he also had time to age up and train with his cosmic powers. He might actually be full on Doctor Strange now. I mean, when we looked at uh, uh, Sing before, uh, they put the. Unicorn plan into motion. Yep. He was very Doctor Strange esque in his combat capabilities. Yeah, he was definitely Doctor Strange in a buff long body. Yep. But now, let's see him do badass wild shit. As cool. I mean, because we like, got a hint of what he could do, like uh, phasing through walls and shit. Yep. And I mean, like, the, you know, you should have saw the Luke Cage parallel and look for his older self coming when you look at his fighting style, even in his younger as his younger self. He fights like your typical black exploitation hero using like Eastern martial arts and shit. Mixed with a little bit of Popeyeism. And if you yeah. look, and if you look at um, early Luke Cage stuff, a lot of what Luke did before we got the modern iteration where he's just a, like, you know, just your straight up brawler, he was very much the, you know, black exploitation hero uses kung fu and shit in his uh, moveset. So, there's that. Sons of the Tiger. Yep, yep, yep. So, now, let's talk about Copernicus, because Copernicus is actually very essential to a lot of the plot. Not yep. just because he is the catalyst to start the whole protocol, but because he actually has a direct connection to the evil. So, yep. who wants to start? 
Brian, Copernicus is your favorite character. And you missed an entire segment, so I'll let you take this one. Yeah, Copernicus is an interesting character because it seems like he's trying to do what he thinks is best, but he also makes decisions that uh, you don't think are, like, typical. Like, the fact that uh, he chose a kid for Sing, and he's the one who's, like, responsible for choosing all of the like host I guess you could say and also though uh, he's been through some shit himself because they set up that mystery and never addressed it yep. yeah he he definitely is a robot but he's a robot powered by magic so he definitely has his own unique little personality and he that he has what I like to call the droid heart to him, because yeah. if you know Star Wars droids, your R two D twos, your C three POs, your I G eighty eights, H K forty sevens, the list goes on. All those droids have hearts and personalities all their own, and so does Copernicus. And one thing oh, yeah. that is clear. Never explicitly said, but it's very clear, is that Copernicus was, until Melinda met the rest of the trio, was Melinda's only friend. For yeah. a while. Outside of, uh, due to time travel fuckery, Emma? Yeah, I, I, I guess Emma counts as her first friend, technically. Actually with but here's the interesting thing that i noticed that you that probably didn't get it's just me and the way my brain functions okay or misremembering when we first see that scene copernicus came with merlin he said i just built i just got this thing he'll help us out to defeat the evil through countless generations yeah never knew of Copernicus's existence. Yeah, I, I think this is this is when, like, Emma was first introduced to Copernicus. So that's why we, yeah. or Melinda was first introduced to Copernicus, which is why, like, I agreed with Brian of, like, yeah, I guess Emma actually counts as her first friend. Yeah, so I just wanted to make sure because that was something that I remembered with through the initial recording, so I just wanted to bring that out there. Oh yeah, no, well, we, yeah. we, we caught yeah, on I, to it as well. I get you. And uh, one thing that I did like about it is that Copernicus had a lot of personality, even, and we kind of like a, got a gist of what he was saying when he was uh, talking. Yeah. Even before we had Merlin there to translate. And exactly. one thing that I like that also is proof of like Emma slash Melinda's, like, long-standing friendship with Copernicus being uh, being her only friend for a while is the fact that eventually when Melinda and Emma start to harmonize more and they're friends, Emma f begins to understand Copernicus. So much so mm -hmm. that when Copernicus is throwing a tantrum and saying, I don't want to participate in this plan, I'm not letting you do it, Emma and Melinda have to be the one like, I know how you're feeling, you big love. Stop, your big lug. Stop being a baby. I can handle it. Yeah, and he's like, no, I'm not crying. It's just it's condensation. Just condensation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> big old yeah. softy. Here's something I find very interesting, though. Mm -hmm. that the show made it clear that he was... Uh, we don't know how he got into that graveyard and why he was activated when he did. And so, like Brian alluded to, we also don't know why he chose the people he chose because clearly, you know, the protocol was to go to the Descendants. But for some reason, but, when Copernicus activated, he chose Emma, the Russian street magician, and, you know, a street urchin gang leader. 
And I think with that, it's more so... Uh, and then kind of made it clear in the show. Oh, yeah. And it, I, I, I think it's more of like Copernicus being a really good judge of character and knowing mm-hmm. that... With the threat that is happening now, these are the type of heroes we need, even if these aren't the heroes we, uh, Merlin, expected. Yeah, and that's... Not the hero that we wanted, but the hero that we needed. I I think the line was the hero we deserved, actually. Yeah, but... Whatever. It's it's continuing on with the unlikely hero trope that I I like in uh, stories Mm -hmm. like this. Copernicus is uh, programming when it comes to those he, like, finding the host that would fit each individual uh, unicorn member is uh, interesting, to say the least. Because, yeah. You know, I mean, given the fact that he was designed by an individual that was more of an antagonist, that... Oh, yeah. That was also powered by elf magic. <laughs> I also just like the interesting like mystery of Otto in the present time realizing yeah, this looks like something I've built, but I haven't built it yet. If that makes sense. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. I'm very curious about that. Yeah, and that also um it makes um, me think that Copernicus into... is a T-800, basically. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can see that. Also, um, that ties into something else that I wanted to mention, which goes back to what you were saying about uh, Copernicus and uh, Emma connection thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was, um, when he got, like, decommissioned, she like freaked the f out and was desperate to get him back. Yeah, and because like uh, again, this was a point where Emma and Melinda were very much synchronized because they dealt with yep. uh, they dealt with her shit, mm-hmm. and so like the feelings Melinda felt were also the feelings Emma felt. But also, Emma does genuinely care for Copernicus in her own right. Yeah, because they had a. Uh... We don't know how many days where it was just the two of them. Before, yeah, before uh, we met uh, the new Edrin and the new Sang. Yeah. And, you know, and it's really cool to have, like, your rotund robot buddy that also works as your mode of transportation. I thought that was super creative. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, and just the a, different forms that he can take. A really great use of animation. Once again, oh, yeah, just yeah. Gendy knows how to use the medium well. Mm-hmm. And Copernicus is the best showcase of that, I feel. Even more so than the amazing oh, action yeah. scenes. Which, they really utilize a lot of different fighting styles and capabilities for each of uh, the Unicorn members. Yeah. Which is and in their own way. I gotta say, man, like you can tell Gendy is a huge anime fan. Because the yep. Sakuga on display during these fight scenes... Give some long running shonen run for their money. Oh, yeah, that uh, especially that last fight. Oh, man, it was like they all did the fusion dance. Man, Dragon Ball, eat your heart out. Like, damn. Sorry, all my mustache is itchy, but. True oh. mustache columns. Yeah. I do. But speaking of dapper mustaches, let's talk about some of the very limited antagonists for this show. I really liked the dapper mustachioed robot man. Yep. Yeah, uh, Dashwood. Yeah, Dashwood. He was cool. Yeah. So Dashwood wasn't really ever like a villain, though. Was no, he? that's why we said he, you know, he's just a minor side character, limited side character. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But the creator was more of an antagonist than. Yep. And I'm one thing I really find interesting about this show: there were no real villain. villain? 
per yeah. se. Yeah, like it does it's do like it, it centers itself around the the age old battle between good and evil, but there's no. I mean, aside from Otto, of course, there is no clear cut. This is the bad guy we need to punch. Well, Otto also they basically revealed that uh, he was just an avatar for the evil. Yep. And yeah, Morgan yeah. and Morgan is the evil's heart. So yes. that uh, leads yeah. to a lot of interesting stuff. And the uh, Eastern Elf King was just a petty fuck. Yep. I mean, I guess elves in this uh, world are just petty fucks. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, I mean, it seems like it. You look at, you know, Abel Wolf. Edrin's dad was cool. I like Edrin's dad. Good guy. Yeah. Yep. But he was just doing what he thought was best. But everybody mm-hmm. else in the various Elven kingdoms that we at least got to see in this season were petty fucks. So, yeah. but who knows? Maybe they'll pull a dragon prince, and we'll get to actually see, you know, cool already on our side, Elven kingdoms in the future, which leads us right into speculation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, me and Tony went back and forth for like 30 minutes in the original section for this. But So I'll just give you the quick and dirty. Uh, like I mentioned before, now that time is all fucky-wucky, I would like for Melinda to possibly meet her Uncle Arthur and her brothers. That would be real cool. I think it could also lead to like a uh, interesting, um, like for him to take like an own unique twist to like a druidic take on like the Green Knight. I mean, yeah. The, I mean, the Green. I mean, the Green Knight is his own separate character, who technically mm-hmm. works for Morgan. Well, in the story, she was just the Green Knight was Morgan in disguise. But yeah, spoiler yeah, alert. Uh... Actually, the Green Knight was just a, a, just a fae that worked for Morgan. Oh just yeah, right, scare. right, right. More, yeah, it was a fae that Morgan hired to troll Gwen. Yeah, to see if he was a chicken oh, yeah, shit or not. Yeah, that's right. Um, I just got confused about it because, uh, in, well, yeah, uh, what Curse did, yeah, Curse, mm-hmm. where they combined the Green Knight with uh, what's his face with Gwen, yeah, but the uh, but yeah, so. Like, I, I would love to see, like, her interactions with Uncle Arthur. I, I want to see the... I want to see what comedic spin that Gendy is going to put on King Arthur, if King Arthur is included. Because I know that they're not going to play King Arthur entirely straight. Because no one in this show is played entirely straight. Even Merlin. I will say, uh, bringing it back to something else that we talked about, Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind if we got like Genji's Genji's take on a uh, the uh, Once Upon a Time Arthur. Yeah. Remember where he was like a uh, semi antagonistic, uh, selfish a hole. Yeah, <laughs> could be a thing. I mean, it, it could explain. It could actually add some nuance to Morgan and Arthur's rivalry as siblings. And kind of show the whole history is written by the victors kind of narrative. Mm. Because, Mm. you know, Arthur won, so he got to write the history. So Morgan's the evil witch. Arthur is the brave hero. I just had a thought. Okay, share that thought. What if the great evil possesses Arthur? So I have a theory of what the great evil could be if we are sticking to the great evil being connected to Arthurian legend. I think the great evil might be one Cas Pollock. Mm. The, you know, everybody's favorite beast of murder, if you're a Fate fan. Everybody's favorite fluffy mascot. Mm-hmm. But, Just, yeah, no... Hmm. I think the evil could be. I keep. I'm really tempted to just call him foe. 
Cath Pollock. Oh. Oh, okay. I get you now. Uh, all right, that that's like, interesting. I think I think that that might be the case, especially because Cath Pollock was a direct antagonist to Merlin and teamed up with Morgan to antagonize Merlin. Oh, damn. Then, yeah, it kind of seems a little bit obvious now. So, I, like, honestly, it didn't click in my head until I watched uh, the scene with, uh, like, the Morgan in the middle of the evil and really thought about it. So, don't feel bad. But yeah, that's that's me spitballing. And some of the other stuff that, you know, Tony and I just went back and forth on in the original record, uh, recording that I'll just kind of speed through. I would love to see, like, the different artifacts, different artifacts that the Descendants mentioned and them actually trying to find them, like Excalibur. Or, you know, let's say, like, ten specific rings from a certain biblical king. You know, that'd be pretty fucking cool. Oh yeah, and I or mean they already mentioned stuff like Pandora's box, and I mean the Ten Rings of Solomon do uh, are a good effective means to sealing away entities. So, you know, there you go. I mean, yeah, I mean one way of going about it. Also, one thing that we talked about is just offhandedly cool, like, uh creatures to throw in like mummies uh yep. frankenstein monster i really want to see frankenstein yeah. monster uh also throwing cool things like uh shinto mythology and other aspects oh yeah shinto mythology like, would be amazing i mean we already saw the kitsune which is featured across you know all east asian mythologies mm-hmm. uh but maybe yeah. an oni would be cool yeah a sexy Oni? Oni? Hello? Yeah. Let, let's Mur do it. Mermoss Blades would be sick. And also, uh, we mentioned this offhandedly when we were talking about Frankenstein's monster. Gendy, you did it in Hotel Transylvania. Make a make a sick Frankenstein's bride. Bride of Frankenstein. Like, make Eve a thing, Gendy. Do it. I know you want to. And make her extra thick 100 percent, please all the seas in the world yeah but yeah also uh, i think jay mentioned it but i brought it up in the original speculation the fact that uh we only got to see two out of the four different uh elves yep Yep. Yeah. I would. Uh, yeah. Seeing the other, seeing the other kingdoms is definitely a big point of interest as well. And you know, uh, Brian mentioned this in the original recording. Also, since we got werewolves, where are the vampires at? And more importantly, yeah. where are the sexy vampires at? Gendy, I know you can draw sexy goth vampires. You drew Mavis. Give us more. Please. Sexy vampire, damn it! Please, please, please. I'm, I'm begging you. I'm, uh, yeah, yes, audience, I am down bad, and I will embrace that. It's fine. I mean, also look. since it does seem like uh, they haven't explicitly stated it, but just based on like how they're he's interacting with everything, since it does seem like they're going the uh, demon route for Merlin actually get to see a succubus or an incubus yeah hell yeah i would add because like there are very few merlin adaptations that really explore the demonic part of merlin so i would like to see um you know more tapping into that um, we got a little taste of it when he was possessed by like otto and his like weird evil spirit tech energy thingy mm -hmm. i know that wasn't the most articulate sentence but you guys know what i mean but you know what would be really cool to actually see 
just for the sake of comedy and hilarity. Okay. Historical figures in this show. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, just to be rather hilarious, why not have fucking George Washington crossing the Delaware while almost getting attacked by a pterodactyl? That sounds hilarious. I want to see them make a joke about Sigmund Freud because I love to laugh at that idiot. Exactly. Yeah. And also, yeah. like, Time Squad already has a perfect comedic model for Sigmund Freud. Shout out to, shout out to Time Squad, one of my favorite forgotten OG Cartoon Network cartoons. Loved that show. Oh, we're with that, uh... Yeah with, with, yeah, with the big buff time cop guy, the little glasses nerd, and the robot, the sassy robot. The sassy robot, hell yeah. yeah. Larry 3000, yes. Yeah. That was that was my shit. I loved time. And uh, speaking about time, since this does uh, like to go with, uh, like, everything happens, like, for time travel, it was meant to happen. Mm-hmm. I wonder how many things we're going to see that maybe were in season one because they had to happen. Like, um, yep. I mentioned this before in the first original recording, but uh, when we like first see Melinda in that big fight, she's hearing a voice in her head. So yeah, true. Emma? Also, please, listeners, I advise against doing a drinking game where you take a shot every time we say... I said this in the last recording. You're oh, gonna yeah. die. Mm-hmm. Please drink responsibly. Probably. But uh, on the bright side, this will be you guys' first ever look at a completely uncut, unabridged Channel Chasers episode. Hope you like it. With uh, a more measured response. From the cast? Yeah, no. After We actually kept it in line. We had tangents, but all those tangents were actually relevant. Oh, oh one, yeah. one thing that I want to add into the speculation slash stuff I want to see part of uh, this discussion is, you know, a lot of what we saw took place in England, right? So, um, why didn't we visit a certain street? At any point, you know, a oh, uh, Baker Street. To meet uh, oh, yeah. the world's greatest detective. Free Batman. His, uh, free Batman. You gotta add, always add that in there. Free Batman. I mean, well, that's debatable. I mean, Batman has outsmarted Holmes in interactions with Holmes, so. That's also I'm, depending on the writer. Though. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can't let my. I can't stop my bat stand from jumping into defensive mode. But that's a debate as old as time. Yeah. But point being, yes, Sherlock and Watson. That'd be great to see those two guys. Oh yeah. They could have done the job better than uh, those those, Scar- those Scotland Yard <laughs> dingleberries. Yes, it was just one dingleberry who was just very adamant. It's like, oh, this, all the spiritualist gang, not crazy magic shenaniganery. They did it with trickery and illusion, smoke and mirrors. Oh, well, hey, even if, even on Lestat is better than that guy. Also. Um, I would like, uh, I think Sherlock and Watson are needed, especially Watson, because these poor folks get roughed up quite often, and Watson is an experienced combat medic. Yeah. So. I mean, when you're, and also you're the one that, Watson's always the one in most of the stories being sent out instead of Holmes anyway, so. Yeah. Which, um, I hate to bring him back to this again, but that was one thing that I really liked about Irregulars, Mm -hmm. is they put more of the focus on Watson. Yep. Oh, and, like, you know, since we're on Adult Swim now, 
slash Max, you can actually, like, show Sherlock Holmes doing all the drugs. Oh my god. <laughs> Have him be so high on opium, where he is floating like a goddamn kite. And that's how he enters the cosmic realm. It's like, holy shit. <laughs> like, so I literally could me. see that as a thing. Like, that's definitely something that is a strong possibility if Sherlock comes in. I mean, if I was high as balls, I, and I see weird, funky animals just floating about in an orange space, I'd be like, what the fuck has happened to me? Okay, and that's, that's, too much dr is that's too much drugs for today. I'm okay. Singh is like, who the hell is this guy, and why is he here? Wait, are you connected to the Why Cosmic we... Realm, too? The what? Yeah. I just did a bunch of cocaine and heroin, and I don't know... What did you do? I've always been here. Without cocaine and heroin? What are cocaine and heroin? Dear God. I have ascended. The opium goes... You've been good goes back today. to the other guy. Goes back to the other unicorn people. What's cocaine and heroin? We'll tell you later, Sam. Okay. Because cause he grew up in the yeah, cosmic realm, which means I also he wonder, still kind of has a bit of yeah, that kid knowledge. I also wonder if, like, you know, Sang from now on will be basically the Captain Marvel of the group. Right. Like, big buff man body. Still, child wonder brain. Uh, maybe, but it didn't come off like that. Yeah, no, he, he, stopped... no he, he seemed more about the business in, yeah. in the actual well, fight. So I could see him being a little bit more of a different captain. Where it's like uh, Captain America, where it's just like fish out of water. He's not really... Yeah. Used to this because, world yeah, as an be adult. because he's used to the cosmic realm. Yeah, it yeah. would actually be very similar to Cleo's character arc in Doctor Strange. So, another another nod to one of Gendy's favorites there. So honestly, we could go on for a whole another episode yep. with speculation. So we're gonna go ahead and just go into final thoughts and ratings. All right, we'll start with Brian. Then go to Tony and end off with me. <laughs> Brian, proceed. All right. So overall, I loved it. Uh, I know you guys mentioned the whole villain thing as like a positive with the fact that we didn't get to see that much of the villains, but I kind of also see it as a bit of a negative too for me personally because just. It would have been nice to see something because uh, basically after after the Kitsune or whatever she was, the fox, goes, we don't really have a clear villain, just an amorphous entity. Uh, and I would have liked to see like more, a little bit more character to her. And uh, this may have come from marathoning it because I know it was intended as a week-to-week -week show. So I had a little bit of an issue with the pacing. And also we had the uh, the triangle square or whatever the hell you want to call it, which could have done, done better. So even though I think that it's great, I'm still going to stick to my original score and go with just a flat nine. All right. So, Tony, your final thoughts, good sir. Well, the whole reason why I brought up the uh, lack of an prominent antagonist is just like I love the idea of just a cosmic force of evil is something you can't ultimately kill in the grand scheme of things because without evil... What does that? Where does that leave good? Yeah, how you know can, what I mean? good can't exist without evil and vice versa? It's. I think that. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to really think about. 
Mm -hmm. I, and, I, I uh, saw it from a perspective of this thing isn't something that can be punched. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to seal it away. Oh, definitely. Because it has to exist Ooh. in order to maintain the balance of things. And I agree with that 100%. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I want to really... What, what I love about... Like this world and the ideas behind it. I just really want to see more of this world and its ideas and how to play with all these super concepts. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And one but one thing I also want to really see more of is just these characters again. I miss these lads and lasses and I just want to see more of them. And Even Jesse still... and James. Yes. I well, those goobers. I would love to see them more, but which we totally forgot to mention, gents. Yeah, they were they were just left uh, hanging in the elf realm. Yeah. Yep, with no way to get back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wah wah. So to not get repetitive. Oh yeah, Tony didn't give his score yet. Let me let me let him give his score and then I'll jump in. Five. Yep. Nine point five. So to not get repetitive and just kind of cut to the chase, I essentially agree with all the points Tony mentioned, as well as Brian. Uh, I watched Unicorn week to week, so I didn't notice a pacing issue. So that wasn't a problem for me. Uh, I already had high expectations going into this, but somehow it met and exceeded them. And being the mythology nerd that I am, the storyteller nerd that I am, I have to give this also a 9.5. It's not a perfect 10. Season 2 has the potential to be. But it's it's right up oh, there. Yeah. It's right up there. And uh, I said negatives, but it's like to a nitpicky level because... 9 out of 10 is still an A in uh, grading-wise. Like a particular episode we did before about a certain wall-crawling superhero. Go check that one mm -hmm. out if you haven't. Link in the also, card at the top. Uh, this is reminiscent of an episode that I don't think the audio people can listen to where uh, y'all gave it a 10 and I gave it a 9.5. Oh, the Sandman one. Yeah, no, the audio people and YouTube people will not be able to see uh, to see or hear that one, unfortunately. But when Sandman Season that 2 comes around... Exclusive. Yeah, when the, when Season 2 comes around, we'll, actually, we'll be able to talk about it because we actually got confirmation that a Season 2 is happening. So let's go! But uh, Lord knows when that's going to happen, but uh, stay tuned next week to figure out why. Yep. Oh, man. So, yeah. 9.5, 9.5, and 9. Long story short, you know, to sum up an hour and 50 minutes of conversation, go watch Unicorn. It's fantastic. So, Brian, go ahead and tell the folks at home what is our special double in this Channel Chasers double special is going to be following up on this well we're doing something a little bit i'd say different because the one time that we tried to do this it got lost because i was uh, high as fuck I'll, I'll i'll go ahead and just admit it i was high as fuck yep but also we're gonna get at the same time a little bit existential and a little bit personal oh it's gonna get and, very, it's uh, gonna get very personal if you guys love my this is us videos it's gonna be on that level of shit and uh what level of shit we're gonna be talking about is uh how i met your father oh man i'm so excited 
I'm, this is Indeed. going to be a really fun conversation. I hope you guys tune in for that one. I'm really looking forward to it. We'll be recording it soon. And remember, we will be going back to our regularly scheduled format of news, trailer talk, and screen time with the How I Met Your Father episode. So if you missed those previous segments, don't worry. They'll be back. Same bat time, same bat channel, youtube.com slash at channel Tasters podcast don't forget to do all the youtube things like comment and subscribe and until next time we bid you adieu for we have been summoned back to our original realms for now we must say goodbye farewell you beautiful so-and-sos